RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the third and final part of the Mattel Aquarius story. We've got the machine all fixed up. If you haven't seen that, go back and check the first two episodes, there's lots to see. But today is all about using the machine. We've heard about the penny pinching, the shortcuts and everything that went into creating this machine. But is it really that bad? Let's see what that all equates to. Let's fire up some games and we've got plenty to choose from, including some unlabeled cassette tapes. So we'll see what's on those. And we'll see if it's as bad as all that or if we can actually have some fun with the machine. We also have the final history lesson in the machine. Let's find out about the final demise of the machine and Mattel Electronics on the whole, because this marked the end of their whole foray into that side of business. So let's get that last chapter now. And by the time you come back, I'll have a tape loaded and something to play. So the press slated it and the public largely ignored it. Of the 32 software titles announced by Mattel, only 21 were released and most of these were ports from their Intellivision console. It's no wonder nobody gave it a second look. Mattel concluded that the money was to be made in games and not the hardware itself, so they called time on the machine just four months after releasing it. Six months after release, in January 1984, Mattel Electronics had closed its doors, but not before they paid Radofin to take back the marketing rights as well as four other companies. Caesar Industries, Crimac Incorporated, New Era Incentives Incorporated and Bentley Industries. These companies thought they could make a success of it and planned to market the Aquarius while making further accessories for it. How do you know if you've got a pre or post Mattel Electronics Aquarius? Well, that's quite simple. Mine has the Mattel Electronics logo here. If yours doesn't, then you have a later Radofin release. Radofin's first move was to slash the price and for a short period, there was a small surge in sales, but it was never enough to lift the machine into the top 10 home micro charts. Here in the UK, it peaked at around the 13th most popular machine. You will remember, however, that Radofin had two prototypes back at the start of this whole saga, Checkers, which became the Aquarius, and Chess, which they announced in December 1983, as the Aquarius II, and this would be released in early January. They even promised the Aquarius III would come later in 1984. Well, we never made it to the age of Aquarius III, but the Aquarius II did make a brief appearance. But what came to be released wasn't the Aquarius II which was envisioned and prototyped, it was more like an Aquarius 1.5. The Aquarius 2 gave us a mechanical keyboard, but aside from that, very little else was new. Sure, it had 20k of RAM present, but that was made up of 4k on board, just like its predecessor, and a 16k RAM pack which was bundled with the machine. More of a pack-in than an upgrade. It had Microsoft Extended Basic to broaden the command set of the Aquarius 1's Basic, but this too was available as a cartridge for the earlier model. The big planned upgrade though was programmable graphics instead of a dependence on the character set of the Aquarius 1, but crucially that never made it to the production version. The follow-up machine then was little more than a basic and keyboard upgrade. Kind of ironic when you consider that back at the start of the series we learned that a keyboard was the only thing Mattel were unable to meet its promise for on the Intellivision. Now it seemed it's the only thing that it could deliver on. Did the Aquarius 2 reverse the system's fortunes? Well, I think we know the answer to that already. Just how badly it failed is almost impossible to gauge though because there's so little information out there about it. I don't know how many left the factory, where it was sold or how many sold. The only information I can find is that it did exist, it went on sale and that's about it. So I think it's fair to assume that the shelf life was very short lived and there's only one piece of software that was specifically made for the machine. That's Logo, a programming language which was also released on many other machines. And of course it wasn't kidding anyone, at its core it was pretty much the same as the Aquarius 1 so it could run all of that older software. And so with that the age of Aquarius passed, in fact it never really arrived. A footnote in computer history that time, a toy company tried to make a home computer and produced little more than a toy. And so the Aquarius went to its grave, a conclusion I'm sure none of you were really that surprised about from the moment you heard its specs originally. However, 
Trevor and I here have been trying out the Aquarius to get a proper feel for it to give it a chance to find out is it really as bad as it all sounds. I've been trying out the games I've got with limited success, some of the tapes don't work, some of them do work as you saw in episode 2 with Pac Mister and then the game just won't work, it's all very odd and I've repeatedly tried that game on both sides of the tape, just can't get it to start. But the thing that surprises me about all of these games is the reliance of the machine on the character set. There's no programmable graphics whatsoever. And the character set is shown here, all 256 characters in the manual. And so the dependence on that same character set, if you find you have the same running man character in multiple games, it all feels kind of amateurish, dare I even say public domain. You might feel cheated if you spent $5.99 on a tape and your friend's spending $1.99 on a far superior and more distinctive game in the shops for their ZX Spectrum or their Amstrad or their Commodore 64. And if that's the case, you may be thinking, well, we've seen Dungeons and Dragons demoed multiple times throughout the series and that has a distinctive look. What makes that game different? And you'd be right. In fact, it's quite a good looking game, but it is still using that character set. Within the character set is a filled block character. So it's more like you're painting with block tools rather than pixels. The difference between using an artist's fine paintbrush and perhaps drawing or painting with a potato to create a potato print. I think that's the best way to describe it. Anyway, let's load up some of these games and let's see if we can identify those characters and see if we can find any hidden gems while we're doing it. I'm particularly interested to know what's on those unlabeled cassettes. So let's fire some up and see what we've got. I decided to start getting to grips with this machine with the games compilation pack. This is a tape published by Adonic Electronics and you would have purchased it originally via mail order. To load a game we type C load or hold control and press Z, Z, Z depending on where you are and press enter. It then prompts us to press play on the tape and the loading begins, all perfectly normal there. Now if the software is written in basic then you leave it to load but if there's an element of machine code to load as well then it's a two stage process. You need to have your finger hovering above the pause button because when OK pops up on the screen like this you have to hit pause because the basic portion of the program is loaded. Then you type run or control and one as a shortcut and it prompts you to load from tape again, this time loading the machine code in. Blink and you'll find yourself starting all over again if you miss that window between the two stages on the tape. The four games on this tape are very simple affairs so I'll just show you two of them. The first is Stalactites. That's a simple shooter where we, the triangle at the bottom of the screen, need to shoot the triangles or stalactites dripping down from the top of the screen. If you like triangles, then this is the game for you. Mmm, triangles. The other game I played on this tape is Macho Man. No, it's not a bodybuilding simulator in the style of Jeff Cape Strongman. No, it's our familiar friend, the running man character. Let's call him Ralph. Ralph is trying to find his way to the top of the screen by squeezing between the gaps. That's all there is to it. It's kind of like Frogger, but without the traffic or the charm of other games of that period. Except for Ralph. Ralph has plenty of charm, of course. Simple games then, but what I really wanted to try next was a full price single game on a tape, a premium game if you like, with support for our RAM extension. And both Aliens and Pac Mister promised this, but sadly neither of those tapes work. Aliens just resets the machine when loading and Pac Mister seems to load, but then doesn't respond to any key presses, I just can't start the game. But I really do want to explore the game's catalogue, so let's cheat a little and jump over to some captures from an emulator to get more of an insight into what games are available, and then I can decide if I should hit eBay and try and find some for myself on tape. Zero In is an educational maze game in which you're given a goal and you have to add or subtract numbers to reach that goal. And it features Ralph the Running Man. Ralph absolutely loves maths. Tron Deadly Discs is based on the film franchise and it looks kind of fun with a backdrop suggesting depth in the arena. And who have we got here? Of course, it's Ralph again. In fact, it's a whole screen of Ralph and he's now with his family, throwing dinner plates at each other like they're at a Greek wedding party. Or at least I think there was a scene like that in the film. Maybe I'm confusing it with Mamma Mia. Continuing the Tron theme is Snafu, which is a Tron light cycles or snake style game featuring triangles and blocks. You're likely getting a feel for the very simple graphics by now. And remember, this is 1983. The Commodore 64 is on sale. This is not, despite how it looks, 1978. 
Astro Smash tries to find its own style, which serves only to highlight the limitations of the machine's graphical capabilities. Drawing with blocks or blocksels in this way gives an almost impressionist style of graphics and highlights again that this is a machine well out of its depth and out of its time. That's not to say the games weren't fun to play though. And one which was particularly fun to play was the game whose namesake is shared by the Aquarius 2 prototype, it's chess. While the graphics could just as easily be that of an Intellivision or an Atari 2600, the 4 MHz Z80 CPU does keep waiting times to a minimum while the machine figures out its next move. The machine is making it very difficult, but I do try to find silver linings where I can. Let's go back to our tapes then, and how about some digital archaeology? I wonder if there's anything hiding away on these cassette tapes which came with the machine when I bought it recently. We'll start with a Philips branded tape, let's slot that in. There's no speaker on our cassette player, so we're looking for flashes on the data light. And sure enough, it does start blinking before long. But the Aquarius itself isn't finding any programs on the tape, so I decided to plug it into the mixing desk and see what it's doing. Let's have a listen. Yeah, if we could load a game from Sister Sledge's Lost in Music, I'd really be very impressed. I wonder what a Sister Sledge game would look like. On to the next tape then, and that's a snazzy TDK branded tape. Very swish and again unlabeled. So what does this have in store for us, dare I ask? Let's find out and cross our fingers that it's a game. Yeah. These are genuine recordings, by the way, direct from the cassette player. There isn't any kind of editing going on here. This is exactly what's on the tape. Climby Fisher won't be bleeding for our Aquarius today. Our Aquarius remains bloodless and gameless. Fingers crossed then for our third and final tape. Let's see if this one has anything for us. Aha. Despite an attempt by men at work to occupy the cassette, they were quickly shut down by the sweet sound of data, and probably any ad revenue for this episode as well in the process. I got quite excited at this point that we might have a hidden treasure, and sure enough the Aquarius found a program by the name of Mine and attempted to load it. On completing the load, I tried to run it, and as fitting as the name of the program sounds for men at work, we won't be going to a land down under, Mine does not run. So quite limited success and frustrations as we tried to get to know the machine with those tapes, but I think we did get a feel for what it's capable of, for what its limitations are, and what it can be pushed to do under supposedly the professionals, the published titles, the premium titles. The only other option, of course, would be to type in your own programs using something like the Aquarius Program Book or 30 Dynamic Games for the Aquarius. And reading your comments from the first two episodes in this series, this machine is how some of you got your start. And I think, because I'm always trying to find a silver lining, as I said in the last segment, there must be something to redeem this machine, and I think this is the answer. If you managed to pick this up in 1984 from the bargain bin, when it was clear that it was dead and you could pick it up for, let's say, £20, something ridiculously cheap like that, it might satisfy your need and your thirst to get into basic programming. Despite its lack of memory, despite its terrible keyboard, this machine could have given you just enough at a low enough price point to find out if you're interested in basic programming, a stepping stone onto better things. And books like this would have helped you through that. Or you'd think they would, unless we take a look in issue two of Aquarius User Magazine. This was published when it was being produced by Radofin, so it's a, a later magazine despite being issue two, where we have such choice letters as this. Have a look at this. Dear Sir, I have tried two of the programs from the Aquarius Users Program book and could not program in either of them correctly. All I seemed to get time and time again was error. Are these programs correct? And if they are, what am I doing wrong? Lee Richardson, Hastings. 
We check this out and you are right. Many of the programs have errors in them and will not run. Our programmer is taking time out to find as many as possible and we will be showing you how to make them work. Meanwhile, a letter is winning its way to the publisher of the book. Thank you. And thank you to Derek Findus and Kim Justice for voicing those letters. You'll find links to their channels in the description. So, those frustrations weren't unique to the machine. Let's, let's remember, let's be honest, when we used to type in the listings from magazines and from books, there were often errors. So that's not an Aquarius specific problem, but it really doesn't help our cause here in this specific example. What could Mattel have done different? Well, I personally think if they'd gone with the chess prototype from the off with the mechanical keyboard, with more RAM, let's say 48K of RAM, and with bitmap graphics and not character set based graphics, they would have been in with a fighting chance. It wouldn't have offered anything special that other machines couldn't. Maybe a lower price point would have pushed it up the charts. But um, what they launched with the Aquarius one, I think we can all agree, it was too little, it was too late, and uh, the fate of the Aquarius was likely written in the stars before it even hit the shelves. Anyway, let me know what you think. Can you think of any redeeming features for this? I am, by the way, glad that we restored this because of those comments from you, because there are some of you out there who started off with this machine. So for that reason, it did deserve the restoration treatment, and I think it looks good for it. And it deserves its place in the cave, not pride of place, but a place where we're reminded that it's a part of computing history and some of the mistakes that manufacturers like Mattel and Radofin made along the way. As always, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this series and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.